Uh, Agile Sparks is a consultant company that deals with small to large organizations, and a lot of times people come, they do this kind of pilot for Agile. It was quite uh, commonplace in the last couple of years. All works well because Agile works. Um, and then if, it's, uh, if it works well, then um, something bad happens, okay? Something good and something bad. The good thing is people like it and they want to do something more with it. The bad thing is they like it too much. They like it too much and they want to apply the old style of rollout uh, to this thinking. So what happens? They say, okay, how long until everyone can get agile? And what we basically see is a lot of groups think about an enterprise of, I don't know, 500, 800, 2,000 people, 200 people, different groups with different managers. Some of them already like the idea. Some of them have not heard much about it. And now we are telling everyone to go do it. So I'm going to use this kind of Kanban board a lot during this presentation, so let's try to understand what's on it. We start from the idea that Agile is good for a group of people delivering a product or a service together. Then they do this kind of planning, rolling out, stabilizing their Agile, okay? Stabilizing is, for example, you rolled out Scrum, you rolled out some kind of Kanban, you stabilize it. You make sure that your current operation works okay, you pass the J-curve. And after that, you go and improve it further. You use the adaptive capability that you created in your organization to get more and more improved results. This is the life cycle of um, agile kind of change that we're seeing uh, in many places. It's not anything new. But what we, we see here is that in this style, we do everything together. We take all of those groups and we tell them, go and plan how you want to be agile, go and start doing it together. And if this is what we need to do, we have a lot of problems. We need to do a lot of groups in a short time. There cannot be many uh, expert people helping them and they typically need a lot of guidance, okay? A lot of cookie cutter level guidance because there's no time to really uh, inspect and adapt and find the right solution. They typically go for something out of the box. And it starts well, but uh, it doesn't take long before you see some signs of trouble, okay? You see some uh, groups that are getting stuck, some that are um, showing some signs of problem, some that are not even starting. It's very hard to get them to start. There are a couple of people, the skeptics, David mentioned this morning, it won't fit here, right? We're different than what happened in the pilot. Or worse than that, the stealth bombers. Those people that fly under the radar, they kind of do things, they work according to the practices, but they know that they don't really want to do this, okay? So they do the minimum possible in order to, to pass. And it creates problems, it creates bad stories later on, and they keep finding excuses why this shouldn't work. And then there is the cargo call. Those people behave more or less like the stealth bombers, but they don't even understand that they're uh, trying to make this fail or not trying to make this work. They just say, okay, the practices, we're doing dailies, we're doing sprints, we're using Kanban boards, that should be enough, right? So they don't really understand. And there are, then there are the ones that do some of the things, but they see this as a business opportunity. An opportunity to get out of jail free if they have a problem delivering because we created a change for them and that's the excuse that they will use right now. So we see a lot of problems, okay? And at the end, there are mixed results. There are the people that make it all the way to being a good, lean, agile group within that enterprise. There are the people that become the zombies that do dailies and say we are agile, we do dailies, we do planning, you talk to them about retrospectives, they don't need the retrospectives, 
no use come out of uh, those retrospectives. They have Kanban boards, but they keep looking the same. It, it differs depending on what they do, but basically nothing really interesting is happening there, and are the groups that threw it away and returned to how they were doing things. And if we look deeper into that, what we see is that the results differ based on the style of group that we are talking about. There are the groups that are excited about change and will do it even though there aren't full solutions on how to do things. There are groups that will do things if they see a business reason to do it, even though there's a risk. There are groups that will do it just because it's exciting and something new. And there are the groups that look for clear solution on how to do things. And there are the groups that, you know, are, are really looking for uh, everyone else to do the thing before they go and do it themselves. They don't want to change. And depending on where each group is along this um, axis, it typically affects where they finish up on this board. Now, one thing that I at least learned from experiencing this once or twice, or a couple of more times, is that this style of push-based initiatives doesn't really work. And if we want um, to, to get to a big organization and have a sustainable lean agile initiative or a real change to how they do things, let's start to use pull mode in that uh, aspect as well. And in a couple of places where I'm working this past year, we've been trying to do that. And it's been quite successful, and that's what I'm going to describe today. So basically what we are doing is we are saying, OK, the same Kanban board, more or less. There are opportunities of groups that would benefit from going agile. Let's consider that our market, OK? We are the change agents inside an organization or the executive management inside the organization. We want to get more and more customers or users inside our internal market to leverage this new thing that we believe will provide them with, with better results. But what we do is we don't tell them you have to do it. We expect them to pull it like consultants, like uh, Apple, like everyone. We can't force you to buy something. We market it to you, and you buy it, OK? So let's use this model. Basically, this is aligned with this thinking of opt-in, which Dan Mezik uh, talks about in his uh, book, The Culture Game. He uses opt-in in, he mentions opt-in in a lot of the agile practices, in a lot of what is um, done that makes work uh, more effective. And the idea basically is don't mandate things. If things have value, people will pull them. They will do them. For example, he says don't mandate meetings. Make the meaning effective so people would like to come to it. And now there's a question, OK, how, what do we do with it in the Kanban world or in the Agile Initiative world in general? So basically, one option is to say the group management will pull the change, will opt in to going somewhere with this. Another option, which is something that we did recently, is to say, you know what, there is no agile training for everyone in the organization. We will do a couple of classes. Whoever wants to come will come. There's no enforcing for everyone to come do it. And actually, what we've seen during those sessions is people that came first were very interested, the first that were interested to do something about it. And they spread the word, OK? And we ended up with everyone coming to those classes, but they were not forced to, to do it. Another question that comes up is, can we let each team decide whether they are going to change? Let's say we have a group of 100 people. The leadership of that group pulled the change. They want to change. But there are still a couple of teams. Is it a decision within a group that is delivering a product or a service together whether each of those teams need to change? That's a good question. What uh, I see the value with Kanban is that it allows you more options. So you can say, OK, as a group, 
we start to use Kanban, but each of the teams will take it to the level that they want. They will opt in to advanced practices like whip limits, classes of service, changing the structure of the lanes in order to accelerate the flow, reducing the batch sizes. Okay, they will opt in to advanced things, but the basic language will be the same. So it's a mix between the fact that the group needs to have a single language and the fact that we want to allow opt-in. And now if we look at the organization, basically what we see is we have some innovators, the people that will take the ID no matter, just because it's a new ID, they don't care about the business results. They will have the visionaries, which see a big reason to do it, and they will do it even though it's not really a complete solution yet. And there are pragmatics who will only follow other people. Conservatives will, will only follow if there are a lot of other people. And the skeptics that will keep struggling for a long time. Does this sound famili look familiar to anyone? Crossing the chasm. Crossing chasm, right? So basically what we are seeing is Jeffrey Moore's model that talks about the fact that there are different constituents, different uh, kind of customers in the market. And we have this flow from the early market through the cousin before the mainstream, and this is something that we see in our change initiatives as well, if we look for it. And what I'm suggesting and we're doing is treat your organization as a market for the change initiative. Okay, and then use what Jeffrey Moore talks about. He talks about the technology adoption for products, but a lot of it applies in our world as well. Um, another good resource to read about it is the Fearless Change book. They, they mentioned this model as well. So basically what we have to do first for the early market is engage in marketing. Case studies, conferences or meetups internally, press releases in the portal of the organization, identify and focus on agents of change, innovators, early adopters, Clear what's in it for me and call to action for the people. Engage good marketing people to do it. Then identify the opportunities. Try to see if the person that you're talking to is, is a good fit for the stage that you are in. If he's looking for, show me three other people inside the organization that did it, and it's, there are no three people like that at the moment, then it's probably a pragmatic or a conservative. It's not the right time to engage him. Don't spend time on him, okay? Try to understand what is the business case for why they are doing things. When you start to do something with the group, since you want that group to stick to the thing and you want to create successes that will later on be leveraged to create a beachhead and drive more people to do it. Focus on starting with the managers inside those organizations. I talk a lot about starting with managers and uh, how we do those things, but as a small recommendation, if you talk about a group of 50, 100 people and you try to scale it, focus a lot of what you do at first on the panoramic activities, the portfolio level activities, whatever you want to call them. Visualize the end-to-end -end flow, not just in the team, but end-to-end, -end, and focus time working with the leaders of the organization to understand what that means and how to improve it. Focus on doing retrospectives across the teams, not just within the teams. Spend your time as a change agent at this level, okay? Because if you get leaders to get, to grok, stop starting, start finishing, a good chance that everybody will. Okay? If they resist, you need to work with them. If you fail to work with them and get them to understand it, then there's no chance. Okay? But at least you failed early without uh, talking to too many people and you remain, you, you give yourself a chance for success later on with another approach. Okay? 
Some more examples of that uh, you can see in the Prezi later on. So let's try it again, this time using the same Kanban board, but using the crossing the chasm techniques. So at first, if it's cool enough, an innovator or two will start doing something about it. If what you are suggesting for the organization doesn't even get an innovator to start doing something about it, you have a problem with your message, with your solution, with your direction, do something about it. After the innovator showed success, then you will have early adopters that will probably see, okay, there is a business case for what we are doing here. This is exciting. This new approach of doing things can help us do better business. If there are not people that can connect it to the business, work on it. Okay? This is a very good indication that you are not talking the right language, not talking to the right people or not doing the right thing. From our experience, if at this point you are able to find an early adopter that is also a hotshot executive in the organization, that's a big winner, right? So try to find people like that that are receptive to the ideas and work with them, invest in them. In one client we did that and it basically brought us the whole market afterwards. And then after those pragmatists, those visionaries, especially if they're hotshots within the organization that are recognized and followed, if they are successful and get to the right side and starting to get value, the pragmatists will start to show interest. But then you are in the chasm. The chasm is the place where the pragmatists start to show interest but a lot of them are very, very scary of what is going on. They don't want to really do this, okay? Basically what we are seeing is the fact that they are more afraid of change. If they see a business case to do something, it's not enough. They are afraid of change, they want a clearer, more dramatic ROI, and they want fuller solutions. They want a lot more guidance a lot more clarity on what they need to do. And here we get into the conflict that we have between prescriptive guidance, which is kind, of, is kind of problematic. I mean, let's not repeat what David said in the morning. We don't like to tell people exactly what to do. It doesn't work. On the other hand, those pragmatics, they expect that. So what kind of answers can we give them? For example, one question that we get a lot is how should our board look like? Give us a template. Give us the best practice policies. And we have a couple of options. One is to say, figure it out. I can tell you because then it will be guidance and it will affect your uh, success. It will not stick. Another is tell them, okay, we worked with other people. Go talk to them. See how they are doing it. Maybe it will be a good start. Another is, here is the starting point based on what we learned so far. Another is, okay, we understand what you're doing, we talked about it, here is the starting point based on our understanding. And another here is the best practices document, okay? Do that. Now, what do you think is the right approach at this point in time? What would you do? Any ideas? The highest one. The highest one possible. The highest one possible. Right. And I, I can tell you that uh, at least in the two big organizations that I'm working with, we tried this one, right? We tried saying, figuring it, up, figuring it out. I was actually too successful in uh, getting the point of evolutionary change to a couple of change agents inside one organization that they kept repeating that and it, it actually backfired. People said, you are not giving us answers, okay? But probably two or three makes more sense for the pragmatics, which brings us to the topic of prescription, okay? And safe and other kind of approaches. My say on things like scaled edge of framework is that they're nice, but they should be considered as guide tours that you can hop on up off of, 
okay? It's not something that, you know, if I had a day in London, I would not go on a tour bus and spend all day just being driven around. I would probably check out what's in the timeout, check out things in Yelp, open a couple of guides, structure my own kind of thing, okay? So look at those things, but make sure they are not your only guide, okay? This is the way we do things, and again, it's just one option to do things. It goes through the stages. It doesn't really tell you how your board should look like, what kind of practices you should do. It basically guides you through the evolutionary change process, okay? And my thoughts about how to fit in the pieces and give guidance, its initial thoughts, is to look at it from an object-oriented perspective. So basically, there are different aspects that work together, okay? There is a driving framework like Scrum or Kanban. There are libraries that interact with it that you can plug in and, and use. And frameworks invite and engage other solutions. And there are options for what solutions to use in each case. So at this point, what you need to do, beyond the, some sort of prescription that is good enough and minimum enough to work for those people, use success stories, okay? Create a beachhead, for example, of all of the projects. We have some success in projects that are doing maintenance. Let's leverage that, create a success story of that, and engage more people that are doing maintenance. Then go to maybe the new product development um, projects or groups in the organization. I'm skipping this point. Um, so at some point what will happen is you get through this chasm, okay? When you get through the chasm, what you see is the growth, the hockey stick, okay? This is a real example from one of our clients, okay? This creates a problem. More and more groups want your help and at this point, you have to find a way to streamline what is going on, to have a method for how to help those groups, have some more structure rather than invent everything each time, okay? This is the time that you want to get more people, have some more uh, structure, and be very careful of spreading too thin. This might be the good time to put a whip limit on your change initiative Kanban, okay? Until then, it's, it's not a real problem because the customers are not pulling. But at this point, there is a problem that the demand is overwhelming the, your capabilities to help people. One small point is that what you will see when you roll out Agile in small and large companies is that after you stabilize things, people stop and don't do anything for a long time. They need to recharge. We need to acknowledge that, and we need to give them good reasons why to get out of this recharge mode, why to go deeper, okay? This is an ongoing challenge um, in, in the places that we're seeing. To summarize, what I was talking about is visualizing and managing the flow of improvement initiatives within the enterprise. You can do, use Kanban to do that. Don't mandate opt-in in a whole lot of levels. For everything that you think, okay, I'll mandate it, think what will happen if I'll do opt-in. Experiment with that. Treat your organization like a market and apply, apply crossing the chasm techniques within the organization. Start with managers or leaders to validate, accelerate, and make the change stick, whatever change it is. Shape the market using metrics, values, expectations. At some point, you might want to change how things are measured so that people will feel it is more successful and easier to, do the, to use the new way of doing things rather than stay in the old way of doing things. You cannot do it up front. It will create too much resistance and cause the, the wrong people to go into the process, but at some point, I'm not sure still when, you should consider doing this, uh, this change. And use frameworks as patterns and options, not mandates or prescriptions, okay? Think about how you would like to go to enjoy your day off on a new city. 
and apply this kind of thinking to what you use in order to drive change. Thank you. Do we have time for one or two questions? Question? Okay, thanks. The Prezi is online, and if you have more questions, I'm at uvaletedrosparks.com or around in the corridors today. Thank you.